Hello, everyone. Welcome to our continuing study in the book of Ecclesiastes. Today, we are going to tackle three verses in chapter eight and draw to a conclusion one of the sections of looking at um, authority. And we began that study a couple of uh, sessions ago, and we'll be completing that and then going on to the next one as part of this particular uh, chapter and study. So before we go into the word of God, we should always lay down a foundation of prayer. So please bow your hearts and join me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We know that there are no such thing as coincidences. And Father, everything that we see in life is a divine appointment. We recognize that nothing escapes your notice. And so you've permitted, you've uh, either caused it or overruled in it. And Lord, so it's, it's filtered by you and being filtered by you, Father, we have complete comfort that it is true, it is good. And you tell us in your word that all things happen for good for those who love you. And so, Lord, we are uh, heartened by that. Uh, we thank you for making every single day special and another day that we might uh, grow and mature in our faith. We just ask the presence of your Holy Spirit to shepherd this next hour, that it might be his words that are spoken and not human words and not human wisdom, but your wisdom, Lord. We pray this in the powerful name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we have been studying here and we uh, take a look at the, um, the, the text today, just three simple verses, but there is quite a bit. Now, we had a bit of an awkward pause the way that we ended our last session, and so we're going to start this session uh, today in taking a look at an appendix. And so uh, you can uh, take that appendix out and perform an appendectomy if you like. Um, so we can take a look at five examples of people who used wisdom to discern the times. And this is a really interesting mini study when we take a look at how people use throughout God's timing to understand certain things and to act in, in accordance with his will. And so we're reminded back in Ecclesiastes 3.1, we saw this, to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. Now, remember that Solomon was writing really under two sets of circumstances. Under the sun, that is life without considering God in it, and under heaven, which is considering God absolutely in the middle of it. And so here Solomon is saying there is a season, there's a time and a purpose for everything under heaven, under God's control. And so once we understand that, there's no coincidence. You know, oftentimes we think that we're subject to some misfortune or random happening. There is no such thing as that. Everything that happens in life is a divine appointment. And so that's one of the major teachings that we have to get our head around. And we, we can intellectually understand, yeah, okay, that's great, but the way we choose to live moment by moment, do we live that way that everything is a divine appointment? And so as we look at this, most of us need for something to happen first in order to discover God's purpose for something. And think about that for a minute. We, we can intellectually understand that God has allowed it to happen, permitted it to happen, caused it to happen, set in motion the circumstances under which it happened, but to us who it's happening in real time, we're not always stopping and saying, so what's God's purpose in this? One of the mm -hmm. things that we should be asking ourselves every time something happens is, what is God's purpose in this? What is he trying to teach me? How is he trying to get me to do something different than I normally do? So the Bible gives us a number of examples, and these are really helpful to take a look at. Uh, these are people that God raised up for his purposes. And when you stop and think about it and consider that these were normal, everyday individuals like you and like me, it's probably not that they understood what was happening to them in the very moment that it happened. 
So the first example is Joseph. Remember, his brothers had conspired against him. Uh, they took him out into the, 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 the wilds. Um, they threw him into a pit. They debated whether they were going to kill him or not. Then they sold him into slavery to the Egyptians, and they had a purpose. And he became a household slave under Potiphar, who was the jailer, and he was falsely accused of trying to rape Potiphar's wife. The fact is that he wouldn't sleep with her. And so he was subsequently thrown in jail. He spent time in jail. He met some interesting individuals there. Um, he he uh, met two of Pharaoh's servants who told him some things that were going on. And when he did, um, he was able to, uh, to understand what was happening. And he was used by Pharaoh and elevated uh, after he told Pharaoh exactly what it was that uh, Pharaoh was was inquiring. And so he became the number two leader in the world because Egypt was the leading power in the world. And he was the number two under Pharaoh. And under his management, the world was saved from a famine. He understood what was the times and he took action. Now, some years later, his brothers came to visit him, quaking because they were from outside the area and they were coming to buy grain. And he revealed who he was, eventually went through a series of, of meetings with them. And in commenting what they did to throw him in the pit and sell him into slavery and think about killing him, this is what he said. But as for you, brothers of mine, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. The fact is that his brothers had conspired to kill him, and they were plotting, and this was a real discussion. It wasn't like, well, yeah, we're going to kill him, uh, euphemistically. No, it was literally. They were planning on doing that, and they meant it for evil. Isn't it interesting that even when people are evil in this world, God still has them under limited control. In other words, not God's limited, but they are limited into what they can do. And God will use even the most evil and vile person for his purposes. What Joseph tells his brothers, you meant it for evil. You were, there was evil in your heart, but God allowed this to happen for good. It's a great insight for us to think about, because even when we are in the midst of a difficult situation, we need to remember that it is our Heavenly Father that's right there in it with us. And trust me, he doesn't act surprised that you're going through this because he already knows how it will all turn out. For the sons of Issachar, this was mentioned last week in our, in our follow-up uh, discussion. The sons of Issachar were about 200 members of the tribe of Issachar who pledged to serve the armies in the early years of King David. And 1 Chronicles 12, 32, and then 38 says this, of the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were 200, and all their brethren were at their command. All these men of war who could keep ranks came to Hebron with a loyal heart to make David king over all Israel. And all the rest of Israel were of one mind to make David king. Now, this is said in passing that the sons of Issachar had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. That whole group of people were specially gifted with prophetic insight to understand the conditions, the circumstances of the day, and then to say, here's what Israel ought to do. This is what you need to do. And they were speaking for God. Remember, a prophet speaks for God to the people. Unlike a priest who represents the people before God. And so the prophet, these you could say all the sons of Issachar were prophets. They spoke prophecy. Interesting. God raises up people for certain times. How about this one? Daniel. Daniel was a member of the royal family. When Israel was taken captivity by the Babylonians in 597, 
Um, actually, 606 BC was the first ca captivity, the invasion and conquering of Jerusalem, then 597, then 586. And he was taken captive in the second wave of captivity because kings would take members of the royal family. So he was a young, young child, perhaps 8, 10, 12. Um, he was castrated and made a eunuch so that he could not reproduce and carry on the royal bloodline. But Emperor Nebuchadnezzar was troubled by dreams, we're told in, in the narrative. It was Daniel who correctly interpreted those dreams. He and his friends were elevated to, to high ranks in government positions. Um, Daniel later interpreted the writing on the wall under Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar. He was then elevated not only under Nebuchadnezzar, but he was then elevated under the folks that conquered Babylon, the Medo-Persian empires, so Cyrus the Great and later Darius, and both of them elevated him to a chief position. And he was uh, among the leaders of what were known as the wise men, individuals who were given particular uh, qualities and capabilities to uh, be able to, to tell the time and understand the times and in, in, uh, what was occurring. So Daniel used uh, or Daniel was used as a prophet when God sent the angel Gabriel to him, gave him the key to all prophecy. We've taken a look at that uh, previously, uh, Daniel uh, nine twenty four to twenty seven. If you want to understand the key to all prophecy, right there it is, and captured in those couple of verses, and then gave him in additional chapters, literally the history, the future history of the world uh, from Daniel's day through the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ. So world history recorded in advance. God used him. God used wise people. And we see that as an example. Here's another great example. Esther, um, her given name was Hasada, which meant myrtle. She was a Jewish orphan who grew up in the home of her cousin Mordecai in the, in the Persian city of Susa. Uh, Xerxes the Great, who was the successor to King Darius, was in search of a wife after he divorced Queen Vashti. And this was a very beautiful woman was her beauty was legendary and so she was selected to be about queen this was about 470 bc given the name esther which meant star but she learned of a plot by the wicked haman who had uh who was an, an officer in the government of xerxes and he had developed a plot to kill all the jews and we can read about the story of her courage and wisdom how the plot was averted and the Jewish race was delivered. And Mordecai, who she was living with, uh, observed this in Esther 4.14, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arrive from another place. It will arise from another place. In other words, Mordecai was confident of the delivery of the Jews because he knew the prophecies of the Jews, and this wasn't going to be the time that they get wiped out. But you and your father's family will perish, and who knows but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. God raised her up for that time to deliver the people in that way, something that was stunning, and we know the story Haman, who had erected a gallows in the town square in the capital city of Susa, was going to impale. It was a when they called it crucifixion, it was actually impaling on a on a vertical spike. And they were going to go and impale all the Jews on that. Well, he himself got impaled on his own device. We know that story. We have Nehemiah. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the Persian king Artaxerxes Longimanus in about 450 BC. This was following after um, Esther. And for whatever reason, he was liked and trusted by the king, who one day observed Nehemiah having a troubled look on his face. Now think about this. Kings don't walk around typically observing the expressions of their servants unless they are 
upset with what that expression looks like. Well, Artaxerxes was upset and he asked Nehemiah about it. Nehemiah said, well, my home city of Jerusalem lays in ruins from the Babylonian siege. It's been in ruins for about 150 years. And so Artaxerxes Longimanus gave Nehemiah both the authority and financing to rebuild Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple that was done before to fulfill the prophecy that Gabriel gave Daniel. And here was the prophecy, Daniel 9, 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, not the, not the temple, but Jerusalem, until Messiah the Prince, until the coming of Jesus Christ, the first coming, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. And so when we, we are going to get into this study in Daniel, Daniel 9, 24 to 27, in great depth as we take a look at understanding the last days, because it's a prerequisite study for us to understand how world history has unfolded. But the key takeaway for us this morning is to recognize that God uses individuals who gifts these individuals with supernatural capabilities to understand the times and to provide guidance. God has done that throughout history. I've just given you five examples. The fact is that there are many, many more examples, and there are those today who serve as watchmen on the tower, if you will, to let people know of the things that are occurring. And so the key that you find is these people are devoted to biblical, literal accuracy. All of them take the Bible literally. All of them take scripture literally. They don't allegorize it. They don't think that it's some fluff writing. It is God's word and they take it that way. So let's continue with our study. Verse 7 of Ecclesiastes 8 says, For he does not know what will happen, so who can tell him when it will occur? Well, we just looked at five examples of people that God told when something would occur. The question is, who is it that doesn't know what will happen, and what do they do instead? The he and the him relates back to a previous verse, verse 6 and 5, where the misery of unsaved man is a result of him never being able to figure out precisely why things happen to them him the way that they do. Now, so many people walk around life today singing, woe is me, and I'm so unfortunate. Why do these things happen to me? And God must hate me. And they, they conjecture, but they're A, unsaved, so they don't have trust in the Lord. And they can't figure it out. They can't figure it out on their own. So they walk around like this young man. What? Doesn't get it. Doesn't understand. Unsaved man stands in stark contrast to those who trust God, like the five that we took a look at. They endure in faith. Whatever circumstances come their way that they find themselves. Have you learned to be content in whatever circumstances you're in? The Apostle Paul tells us that despite being tortured and beaten and whipped and rejected and slandered and drowned in the ocean twice. He learned to be content in whatever state he was in. So whatever circumstances we find ourselves, we have plenty of examples in the biblical record of people that survive those things. But remember, the overarching point is that God controls all circumstances and timing. So whatever happens to them, God is in control. That's something that we should be very much aware of. Now, 1 Corinthians, written by Paul, in chapter 10, verse 13, says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as, in, as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. You look at the word temptation is testing. No testing has overtaken you such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tested beyond what you are able, but with the testing will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. When you go through a situation and you feel like giving up, understand that God knows what your capabilities and limits are, and he's not allowed you to be in a situation 
that you cannot go through. He's given you the way of escape. He will not allow you to be tested beyond what you are able. Now, we, you either trust him or you don't. These are the times that we really test ourselves to see whether or not we're in the faith. And do we trust him? You know, Job, we all know the story of Job. Job didn't have the benefit of Job chapter 1 and chapter 2 to read that ahead of time to wonder why his family had been wiped out and every bit of his worldly wealth had been wiped out and his nagging wife was telling him to curse God. He didn't have the benefit of the reading about it. Guess what? You and I do. Do we actually learn when we read these things? Do we do we connect whatever we're going through right now to realize that we have example after example after example of people went through far worse than what we're going through. We get razzed when we're sitting in a traffic light and the person doesn't move for three seconds and we're like all ready to erupt. The issue is we need to take a lesson. We need to actually learn these lessons that Solomon is trying to impart to us. You see, even saved man who's knowledgeable about the scriptures doesn't know specifically what day and what hour future events will occur. We know the Lord's coming back, but we don't know the day and hour. Well, guess what? There was a point in time when even the son of God didn't know the hour. We have this amazing example of what Jesus told his disciples in the timing of his return. Look at this from Mark 13, 32 and 33. But of that day and hour, his return, no one knows, not the even the angels in heaven nor the son, but only the father, only father. God knows. Take heed, watch and pray for you do not know when the time is. Well, there was a time in his ministry. He had not yet been crucified. He had not yet been resurrected. He had not yet ascended. So that was true at that time that he didn't know. Boy, that gives us an understanding of the faith that he had in his father and his trust in his father to allow himself to be crucified. He knew that he was going to be crucified but at a, per, a point in time in his earthly ministry, he didn't know the date and hour. He had to trust his father. We don't oftentimes think about that, do we? That Jesus had to trust his father, even though he was the son of God, fully man, fully God. Amazing. Amazing. Trust in God despite the circumstances. So while saved man doesn't know the precise timing, God in Scripture reveals what will happen. We know the events. We know the outcome of events. We know how things turn out. You and I have all read the last couple of sentences of Revelation, the book of Revelation. We know how things turn out. But everything is based on if we love God. Do we love God? Part of the test of our maturity and part of the test of our loving God is how we deal with circumstances that suddenly spring up and we are surprised God is not. God says, I'm not allowing you to go through this if and being taxed beyond your capability. I'm there with you. We got to trust him. We have to trust him. The five examples of people who used wisdom to discern the times, each was wise because they first laid hold of the fear of the Lord. If you go back and look at them, they all exhibited the fear of the Lord first, which then led them to trust God as a result to become wise. And they then fulfilled the mission that God sent them to fulfill. What mission has God sent you to fulfill? He has. He just doesn't like have a whole group of people out there that eh, nothing to do, just hang out. No, you have a very specific mission. And if you don't fulfill the mission, he's got to raise up somebody else who will. Because his purposes will always be met. So here's a really good way for us to take a look at. The first thing we have to do is lay hold of the fear of the Lord. That's what our study in the book of Proverbs was all about understanding the fear of the Lord. It's the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom doesn't begin until the fear of the Lord is present. 
And the fear is not, oh, Lord, you're going to zap me. I, I, I can't. No, no, no. It is awe. It is reverence. It's seeing him who he is, almighty God, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. Seeing him who he is and giving him his due for who he is. It's reverential awe. But there's also a healthy mixture of fear because he's God and you're not. And recognize that. So that that is bound up in that concept of the fear of the Lord. And so once the fear of the Lord, you've been established in that, then you can trust God only for your salvation. How did people in the Old Testament get saved? Same way we do. They trusted God for their salvation, that God would provide the way. And as history unfolded, those who were in Abraham's era and Solomon's era, they were anticipating what would God, God would do. You and I are the beneficiaries of being 2,000 years after the time of Christ's crucifixion. We see what's happened. They had faith before it happened. Oh, trust in God. This is what trusting God is all about. You see, as you learn and grow, systematically, you should be coming wiser and more mature in your faith. No, is it something that's going to happen? You know, you get saved and then boom, you know everything? No, 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 no. You had how many years training in the ways of the world and the ways of the world system before you got saved? I had 20 years of training in the world system. Some people don't get saved until their 40s. They have 40 years of it. We get a lot of untraining to do when we come to faith later on. If you happen to be one of those young children that from an early age were taught and believed, by the way, just because you got water sprinkled on you didn't mean that you necessarily believed. So that's a good question. Are you in the faith? Something Paul reminds us every time we take communion, we ought to examine ourselves to see whether or not we are in the faith. First in the faith and then staying in the faith. So we become wise and grow as we trust God because God sends his indwelling spirit who teaches us all things and leads that process of our maturing in Christ. That's called sanctification. It's just, look, at the moment that we were saved, we were justified. We were declared legally free from the penalty for our sin. We would not have to face eternity separated from God, which is the second death. Instead, we would go through the, our normal life, and in the small exception of being the rapture generation, we are going to go and die a mortal death. But during that time, from the time that we are justified, we first believe, and the time that we pass into eternity after we die our mortal death, we're supposed to go through a process of systematically freeing ourselves from the power of sin. We're judicially free from the penalty. Now we will be systematically freed as we grow and mature. So one day when we get resurrected into glory, incorruptible, we are freed from the presence of sin. So our abilities here are all equipped by God. We have the capability of fulfilling the mission. God designed you to fulfill this mission. God gifted you with capabilities to fulfill the mission that he designed you for. By the way, he doesn't make design flaws. That's man. He's not man. He's God. So we look at this, and as we grow, then we have an opportunity to fulfill that mission that God designed for us. And it may be very different than the one you think he assigned you to do. Part of the joy of being a Christian is understanding and with the discovery of what God designed you to do, what special place he made for you in this world to do the work that he equipped you to do, that he's going to equip you to do, empower you to do. In all the cases of these five people who used wisdom to discern the times, they endured unknown, unfortunate hardships and circumstances, but they trusted God through all of it and were eventually rewarded by God for their faithful endurance in this life, plus 
eternal rewards. Their ERA, their eternal rewards account must be huge. It's what they did. They chose to trust God. There's always, always, always a profit to every human being to trust God. It's deposits into your eternal rewards account. So consider Hebrews 11. We call it the Hall of Faith. It's the recitation of a whole bunch of people who were God's heroes in the faith. There are examples today when we go through tough times, we had to read Hebrews 11 to see what some of the other people went through. Few of us have been asked to be sawn in half. Few of us are going to face that or burned alive. Few of us are going to face that in our testing. To many, to us, the testing that we have seems large. In light of what has happened to God's people, it may be merely a hangnail. But it seems large to us. God will see you through it. Despite the circumstances, these people trusted God. Whatever situation they found themselves into, they endured in faith. They endured in faith. And each laid hold of the hope and the future that God promised. God says, I have a hope for you. I have a future for you. And he's promised that to each one of you and me. We have hope in a future. We're not like those who have no hope that don't have salvation. If you've accepted Jesus Christ, then you have the certainty of a hope and a future. So you and I can endure everything that life throws at you because God says he's not going to allow us to be tested beyond what we're capable of handling. See, conversely, those who are simple, who simply, they're simple minded, they don't, they don't have not trusted in God. They're fools or scorners or the wicked of this world. They use ungodly means and many, many schemes, as the passage said previously, but attempting to know and shape and react to their future as it happens. So we just need to be aware of that. So let's continue here. We've, we've uh, handled uh, verse 7. Let's take a look at verse 8. We're going to do that in three parts. No one has power over the spirit to retain the spirit. No one has power over or power in the day of death. That's the first part. In order to understand this, we need to understand the words. So the word power, no one has power, shalat, which means to have or bear dominion, rule, or power over something. And by the way, it's no one has power over the spirit to retain the spirit, and no one has power in the day of death. Interestingly enough, that power is a slightly different form, but it's the same root word, shalat. To retain it, that means is kala, which means to hold back or hold in, restrict, withhold, restrain, shut up, or prohibit. That's kala. And spirit here is being used, ruach, in the Hebrew. Greek is much more precise when it comes to this, but ruach in Hebrew means a breath, and it's used to define both the spirit of man and the Holy Spirit, God being a spirit. And so both uses may be in play. The context in Hebrew determines which of the two uses this is. So when we look at this, the first part of verse 8 says that no human being has either been given or possessed power over his or her own spirit, or the wind, or the Holy Spirit. All three of those are proper renderings of the word ruach. So the first part of verse 8 there says that. In context, remember, Solomon previously concluded that no human being has the ability to know what will happen in the future. We just looked at some of that uh, before we went to this particular verse. God, whatever God has revealed, God has revealed, and that's to the extent that we can know and understand the future, what he's revealed to us. Some things he's chosen not to reveal. His purposes are just fine. They're right. They're correct. And when perhaps when we're on the other side of it and we engage in the conversation, well, why didn't you let me know such and such was going to be happening? Don't be surprised to hear because I love you. And see how that fits the situation. 
Likewise, no human has the power to prevent his or her own death, nor to put back the spirit once it's left the body. You know, you, you don't see a corpse going in there and, you know, gets an electrical shock and says, Wah! grab this thing before it goes, put it back in my butt. No, 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 no. No human being has the ability to do that. The only safe place then, folks, listen carefully, is to be in God's favor by first accepting his offer of salvation and then walking in obedience to what he tells you to do. Executing your mission. I don't care if your mission says that you're to stand in the middle of the battlefield with live ordinances dropping on you all around. If God tells you that's where he wants you to be for his purposes, not for your ego, but for his purposes, you do it and you're safe. You were held in his hand. Scripture tells us that God holds, God the Father holds you in his hand, and God the Son holds you in his hand, and you were clasped tightly in those hands, which just happened to be the most powerful hands in the world. They created everything. They sustain everything. The safest place to be is in God's will, doing what God has asked you to do in his timing and in his methods as his witness. That's the safe place to be. Well, let's continue with the second part of this verse. There's no release from that war. Interesting. No release from what war? What does that mean? Well, we need to understand the Hebrew vocabulary. Release is the word mishlachath. You can't pronounce Hebrew unless you spit on the other person. Mishlachath, to, dis to be discharged or released from service. This has both a temporary release and a permanent release considered. Both are, are operative in this word release, temporary and permanent. War is milchma, which means battle or fighting engagement contest. It likens life to an ongoing struggle or battle. Have you ever wondered why you feel weary from being in the battle because you're just going through life? There is a battle. It is a battle. There is a spiritual battle with unseen forces going on around you right now. If you and I could see into the spirit world, we might see angels doing war above us and around us, protecting this time so that we could study God's word in peace. Don't underestimate what goes on in the unseen world. It is an amazing thing. One person I'm aware of in scripture was given the ability after, and I think it was Elisha's servant was given the ability. Elisha prayed that his eyes would be open to see the spiritual battle going on around him as the, the servant was freaked out because the king had sent a group of troops around them. We have to understand that there is a war going on. And to deliver the word malat, to cause an escape, a rescue from the ongoing battle of life. So it says there's no, no discharge from this battle or engagement. We're going to get delivered, though, because that's coming here in the next passage. This no release is actually uh, this, this thought here. So we need to understand there's an orientalism here when we talk about a war when war broke out in israel military service was mandatory with no exceptions no deferments by the way that's true today it's true today every 20 year old has to serve without exemption i mean you know if they're a paraplegic yes i understand that but if you're able-bodied you have no ability to say, well, I don't feel like it, or I, you know, I'd rather be an artist or, you know, let me go do something else. It's required. It's a requirement. By the way, that's another example of having no control over the outcome. And it's, if it's mandatory service, it's mandatory service. So you go and you do it. God's in sole control of the outcome. Let's not forget that. The outcome will be whatever he deems it to be, whether death or injury or something else. When you're in a war situation and you go on, go into that war as a Christian, if you die, that was God's purpose. You, you, we don't like to think about that. Even Jesus, when he faced the cross, said, if there's any other way, Lord, but not my will, your will, Lord. 
I mean, it wasn't pleasant to him to think about having to give over his life. And he knew the purpose for which he came. And he was going to fulfill that mission exactly as God revealed it to him. See, this is a real test of Romans 8.28, which we love to read and put it a lot of places in our house and put it on bookmarks and so forth. But do we believe it? And we know the most three most important words there. And we know. It's not we speculate, we think, we believe, we, we know that all things work together for good to those who, what does it say? Love God. All things work together for good to those who love God. There's an operative requirement, a condition to those who are the called according to his purpose. Well, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you're called according to his purpose. The question is, do you love him? If you love him, you do what he says you to do. Not questioning. You do it knowing that you're fulfilling what your Lord and Savior has asked you to do. Finally, the third verse, the third, third part of the verse, and wickedness will not deliver those who were given to it. Okay. Again, let's look at the Hebrew vocabulary. Wickedness, rasha, which is the state of being morally wrong or evil or corrupt, Wickedness is always a choice to follow Satan's way. And if you're following the world system, who controls the world system? Satan. It's his way. So there's nothing good in your flesh, by the way. You go ahead and follow that because your flesh is corrupted with sin. And sin's what was introduced when Adam and Eve decided to listen to Satan's voice and choose his guidance rather than God the Father's. Deliver the word malat, to cause an escape or release or rescue from. This here is in this particular portion of this verse, it's a release from the power behind the wickedness. Remember, there's always a power behind the wickedness. We oftentimes think, well, things. No, 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 not things. There's a malevolent evil force called Satan, a person. A created being who has limited power, he's behind the wickedness. We need to understand that. Given, the word given, to those who are given to it, balal, baal, rather, a power that has mastery over someone or something. You see, wickedness tends to own those who are under wickedness. If you follow after wickedness, it gets to own you, just as Satan gets to own you. Here's a third certainty then. Wickedness never delivered a single human being or even a demon or even a fallen angel from the consequences that await in the final judgment. Understand that. They're not going to be delivered by their own power. There's only one delivery. There's only one way. There's only one way to salvation, and that is through Jesus Christ's substitutionary death for you on the cross. Even for those who are saved, to those who are saved, there's both temporal consequences in this life, and eternal loss of rewards for those who practice wickedness. You could be saved and choose to practice wickedness. In a very real sense, Adam and Eve were saved. They were holy. They were without sin before they chose wickedness. Huh. For those who practice wickedness, there's always consequence. But for those who are gods who choose wickedness, the penalty is not so much that you lose inclusion in heaven with God. One cannot lose one's salvation. It's not up to you didn't it's not in your power that you got it. It's not yours to you can't pluck yourself out of it. You can't remove it if you were saved, you were saved. You may escape what is planned for those who are unsaved, who is chosen to reject God and his salvation, you may escape that, as the scriptures say, and have the smoke of fire on your garments, because that's where they're going, to hell, to burn. To me, it's so sad to be deluded into thinking that we can get away with wickedness. Galatians 6, 7 sums it up very simply. 
Whatever a man sows, that also shall he reap. We see that throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. If you sow it, you reap it. If you sow a tomato seed, you get a tomato. You don't get a chihuahua. You get a tomato. Whatever you sow, you reap. So it's an obvious question because we like to look at limits. Is it ever okay to defy the authorities who God allowed to come to power? We know that God raises up all authority. We looked at that a couple of sessions ago. So in our study of Proverbs, we examine this topic in detail in session 32 in Proverbs, the embodiment of wisdom, what God expects from kings and leaders. You can access that. There's your streaming address. You go to streaming, you go through the menu, take a look, grab Proverbs session 32, and you'll see what God expects from kings and leaders. So the answer is yes to defying authority when authority is attempting to get you to do something contrary to God's law or commandment. Even though God raises up the authority that now it tells you and directs you to do something in defiance of what God said to do, and you are to follow what all authorities say, except in that case. And scripture is very clear about this. Remember what happened in Acts 4 and 5. John and Peter were brought before the council and forbidden to teach about Jesus Christ, even though people were getting healed. Nobody could deny that this lame person who was lame from birth was now healed and jumping around and frolicking. And you can't deny it because they'd seen him for, for day after day after day after day after day because he was in a prominent place. But the Sadducees and Pharisees, well, this doesn't fit our theology because we got a pretty good like racket going here. You know, we get people coming in. They don't bring things to make sacrifice. So we've got the local monopoly on taking all the, the, you know, we buy the cut rate stuff for sacrifice. We sell it at first class prices. We've got a pretty good deal going on here. They were corrupt. They wanted power. And so they saw this as a threat. And so they threatened Peter and John from teaching in the name of Jesus Christ. I love this passage. Acts 5, 27 to 31, and then he brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked, saying, did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name? And look, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. They were scared. They realized that their little subsidies and their little atrocities were going to come to an end, and they might actually have to work for a living if they wanted to eat. Did we not strictly command you? I can I'm a righteous indignation. Watch out for that. I love this. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered, hanging on a tree. By the way, that was not designed to get them friends and influence in high places. They told the truth, and they had boldness. By the way, they lived well beyond this event. All right? So Jesus defied the chief priests and elders often as when he healed people on the Sabbath. We had examples of that. They defied these authorities who set themselves up as the self-proclaimed professional religionists of the day. By the way, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego defied mighty King Nebuchadnezzar. They were thrown into the oven, but they were unharmed. Looked in and saw the Son of Man, Son of God, walking around the fire with them because he's in it with us. Don't forget that. However, before you embark on defying authorities in a matter, the first question is, have you brought the matter to God? to ask him for direction on whether or not you should defy the authority. That's a first step. Remember, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and wisdom is when we come to God because we don't know, and we need his guidance in a situation. Now, he may want you to simply bear with it, 
bear up silently because that will ultimately bring him glory. Or perhaps prepare you to minister to someone who's suffering in the same thing or to fulfill his purposes in another, some other way. When you bring it to God and engage in the dialogue, rather than just go shoot from the hip and act out of your flesh, that doesn't, that rarely works because we are still SIN positive. Even though we may be born again, we still have sin tendency. So we have to go to God first. We need his guidance and advice when we don't see it clearly. We should never defy unless it honors God. I'll show him. No, you won't. Boy, Satan would love you to do that. If you bring his name into disrepute, you've just engaged in Satan's agenda. That's what he wants you to do. Solomon, as well as David, did not approve of plots against leadership, since plotting hides wickedness under the cloak of deception. You can find this in many of the Psalms and Proverbs about hiding wickedness, wickedness appearing as good. See, when it comes to matters of conscience and law, wise Christians should follow the guidance of Peter and obeying God rather than obeying men. This is really good instructive leadership for us by Peter, ultimately under the ministry of the Holy Spirit and of Jesus Christ, to obey God rather than to obey man. When there is a choice where there are two different directives being given, obey God first, obey man second, but first go to the Lord and ask, request. So how should a believer take action against an order or law that's opposed to God's command? Well, recall that Jesus' half-brother James offered guidance that we should apply whenever we're unsure. He says, you got to seek wisdom from God. Look at this. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. There's no other place to ask. Let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. He's not going to get angry with you because you've asked for wisdom. In fact, he's going to congratulate you and thank you for asking him for wisdom. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like the wave of a sea driven and tossed by the wind. Don't, don't be wind driven. Ask in faith. If you ask doubting, no, then it's not going to happen. And you're making a testimony against God because you're not asking in faith. So your testimony doesn't bring God honor and glory. We need to ask in faith. We ask in faith when if any of you asks, lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith. You believe that God is going to do this because he promises to do it. See, in Ecclesiastes 8, Solomon offers four different ways that believers can resist authority when it's in God's will to do so. And we're going to do this by applying in reverse what Solomon directs us to do to be obedient to kings. And this has to be seminary based because it's going to use alliteration, four Ds. And whenever you see alliteration, that's because, you know, I don't know, they, it's what they do, I guess. Um, desertion, the first thing. Ecclesiastes 8 3 said, Don't be hasty to go from his presence. Well, what's the reverse of that? Go from his presence. So you resist, you go away from the presence of evil simply by leaving the field of conflict or battle. One of the ways that you resist something that is not under God's, not, not in alignment with what God has asked you to do is to simply walk away from it. Walk away. By the way, you can avoid a lot of arguments if you'll do that. You can avoid entangling yourself in a lot of bad situations if you simply walk away. That's one way to defy an authority that's telling you to do something that is contrary to what God says. A second way is defiance. That's the second half of, of verse 3. Ecclesiastes 8, second half of verse 3 says, do not take your stand for an evil thing. Well, if you don't take your stand, then you resist or take your stand against that evil thing 
which the authority is directing you to, to support. Sometimes you need to resist. You can walk away, you can resist. A third way to handle it is to be disobedient. Ecclesiastes 8.5 says, he who keeps his command will experience nothing harmful. Well, that's if you're, hand, if you're doing what a king is telling you to do, except if he's asking you to do something that's against God's word, then you resist, you passively ignore, you just don't comply. I understand what you're asking me to do. That may be the appropriate answer to give, but you're not going to do it because you are disobedient it under God's direction. Remember, under God's direction. Last but not least, dispute it. Ecclesiastes 8.8c says, wickedness will not deliver those who are given to it. Well, you can resist it. You can resist it. And to example, you can, so think about an ungodly law that's there. How does a, how does a believer resist an ungodly law? Well, you could take action to have that law overturned. You could you could get a group of people together and start a class action suit. You can gather petitions. You can go and petition one of the courts. There are legal ways that honor authority, but don't dishonor God in the process. So here's four different ways that scripture suggests to me. So verse nine. Let's look at verse 9, our last verse. We're going to make it. All this I have seen and applied my heart to every work that's done under the sun. There's a time in which one man rules over another to his own hurt. Well, what's the conclusion here? What he's saying is he's seen and applied his heart to every work that's done under the sun, which is saying he simply actively observed a multitude of situations where man's in a variety of leadership positions. Remember, this first section of chapter 8 is taking a look at um, if, of, of evil in authority. Solomon qualifies this as being under the sun, so it's a secular view. I have seen and applied to my heart to every work that is done under the sun. Every work means qualifying this observation is taking much time and effort in consideration. He hasn't jumped to any conclusions, so his observations are as valid as possible. Verse 9b says there are times when one man rules over another to his hurt. Solomon realizes that there's always consequences of how a leader leads. So I see there's a time when one man rules over to another to his hurt, meaning the leader's hurt here. When adding God to the picture, leaders who have great opportunities are going to be held to greater accountability by God. You and I will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Remember Luke 12, 48 says, for to whom much is given from him, much will be required, and to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. So what we have here in looking at and, and sort of graphing out what's happening in uh, chapter 8 is verses, verse 1 is sort of the setup of it. Verses 2 to 9 is talking about authority. Then we talk about inequity, which is next, which we're coming up on next. So when we've, we're now done with verse 9, so we're going to look at ne next time, we're going to look at Solomon turning his attention to evil done through inequity. Well, what's inequity? Inequity is fair and impart, or equity rather, is fair and impartial treatment. So inequity is the opposite of that. It's unfair and partial treatment. So what does that mean? Well, let's look at this in, in context here. Luke 12, 42 to 48 said, And the Lord said, Who is that faithful and wise servant whose master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion and food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him and in an hour when he's not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will did not prepare himself or do any do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes, many whiplashes. But he who did not know and yet committed things deserving of stripes, he shall be beaten with a few lesser, lesser punishment. 
For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. So what principle of equity did Jesus set forth here? Very simple. Different duties assigned to different ser servants. Whatever the master deems appropriate is the way that they're assigned. The master held all servants to the same standard for the outcome of the wise and faithful discharge of, of duties. That's what the master did when he, when he went away. So blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say that we will make him ruler over all that he has. Well, for those who are found wise and faithful in doing, the master rewarded the servants. Everybody got an equitable treatment based on whoever met the standard. What about those that didn't make the standard? Well, let's take a look at these folks. And the servant who knew the master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But the servant, but he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of strikes, stripes, rather, shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given from him, much will be required. And to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. So again, continuing, what principle of equity did Jesus set forth in this parable in Luke? The servants who made the choice to ignore the master's instructions or those who did not pay any attention when given the instructions, they, they were just tuning out. They should have been listening, but they tuned out. Well, they're going to receive equitable treatment based on the standard of being wise and faithful. So the same, they're going to, there's the standard. They're going to get judged against that standard. If you do what you know you shouldn't do, if you intentionally do, do the wrong thing, your punishment's greater than when, if you unintentionally, you didn't intend to do that. By the way, God understands the intents and thoughts of the heart. Man's legal system often uses lady wisdom as his icon of assuring impartial equity. Uh, that's why you see the, the, the lady wisdom is blindfolded, holding the scales up blindfolded. Solomon will observe that equity is found in principle, but not always in the practice of ungodly people. So you'll find our government has a sense of equity when being practiced by rank unbelievers, but there is still a promotion of fairness. We're going to understand that that's a pretty slippery thing to do. So three things to consider. First, key takeaway, have a right relationship with the creator of the universe all that's in it. He created it. So the best place to be for us is to have a right relationship with him. Key take takeaway number two, once we're in that right relationship, then learn what God has assigned to you to accomplish during your mortal years. What, what's his mission for you in your life? Are you discharging that mission? Third takeaway, and we'll end on this one, be found faithful in executing your duties to the best of your ability. And remember, seek his guidance. Ask him for wisdom. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the truth of this message today. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for its relevance to our day and time. There are no such thing as coincidences, Lord, and everything is a divine appointment. So in many senses, what we go through day to day is a test that you are looking at for each of us, not because you want to catch us doing something wrong, but because your hearts, your heart beats for us to be doing something right, to be trusting you, trusting you for the truth. That's what you really are looking for. And that helps us to grow in maturity and grow away from that sinful person that we were when we came to you in faith and accepted your salvation gift through Jesus Christ, and now are trying to learn and grow in wisdom and step-by-step step releasing from the power of evil and sin over our lives, that we're growing more and more Christ-like. Father, thank you for permitting us to do that and having time in this life to grow and mature, that we might grow into the person that you would have us become. We pray, Father, that in the coming week, you will remind us many times of these truths, and you will be communicating with us as we seek your face 
as we ask for wisdom of how and what and why and when and where. Lord, we know that you are not leaving us to our own devices, that you love us. And we thank you, Father, for the truth of your word. We thank you for all of these things in the precious name of your Son, our risen Lord, risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And God's people said, amen, 